Welcome to the How Conversation series. We are so delighted to have with us today, Lieutenant General Nadia West. Welcome, ma'am, it's good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Dana, and it's Nadia. I keep telling you that, and I appreciate you, ma'am, but you know, we're, we're too good of a friends now for that, okay? All right, well, as a retired one star, I call it the one versus three, you're a three star <laughs> rule, so I, I can't get away from Nadia, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Lieutenant General Nadia West, has just recently retired from the United States Army after 37 years of service. She graduated from West Point in 1982. Uh, women first became part of the Military Service Academy starting in 1976. So she was in the third class of, uh, to have women in their class. She retired last year after being the 44th Surgeon General of the United States Army and Commanding General of the US Army uh, Medical Command. I'd like to start just uh, by asking you what led you, one, into uh, the military, but also into being a, a doctor and, and in medicine? Well, uh, well, thanks, Dana, for that nice introduction. Um, what, what led me to the, into the military was um, my family. Um, that's the, you know, to, at the first part of it. My dad was in the Army for 39 years, or 33 years. He joined the Army in 1939 when it was still, um, still segregated. Our nation was segregated. The military was. And so he was trained at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is where they sent all what they called the colored troops at the time. The integrate, you know, the order to, um, executive order to integrate the military um, was in 1948. It wasn't perfect because, you know, people resisted and the way that they kind of got around rules and things of, okay, this company will be black, this company, two companies will be white, but the battalion is integrated. So not quite there yet, but it was, it was getting there. And so, um, you know, and I give that background to say, you know, hearing my dad telling the stories, there was no bitterness, there was no negativity. You know, that's what really inspired me to join the military. I couldn't wait my turn. And then the medical piece, again, the, you know, I was, I, I liked sciences. I liked, you know, uh, you know, I, I did very well in sciences. You know, I was Star Trek, you know, a child of Star Trek during the time. And so um, putting together, working with people, serving my nation, and, um, you know, some of the sciences, so, you know, medicine, of, of course, there's a lot of science, you know, um, you know, science-based type, uh, you know, information you need to know and, and, and to be able to help people with that, kind of put everything together in a, in a career that I'm just, uh, you know, so honored and blessed to have had. You know, you ooze, sorry to use a medical term, uh, <laughs> humility. And, you know, humility as a virtue often is uh, linked to this sense of, of service, but you also exude um, confidence, you know, blended with that. But yet you've shared some very um, personal stories about really struggling with confidence, uh, particularly, you know, in a tough environment as you were <laughs> in those early days of, of women and being a woman of color at, at West Point and, and working hard to earn, you know, a slot to go off to a very selective graduate program. I wonder if you might uh, share some of the journey that you've had in terms of confidence and humility and how maybe your purpose uh, has has kind of oriented you some. Well, that's uh, you know that's a great question. I appreciate your your you know your attributing humility to me because we all can work on that. I know I can still work on that. Um, and I, I heard a really good uh, commentary just the other day. Of the definition of humility. So humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And I was like, I really love that because. You know, it's not like a self-deprecating self, you know, you, you know, um, just, you know, always down on yourself. So you don't, you know, um, you know, are not, I guess, dissatisfied with, with the type of person that you are, who you are. Um, but you think of yourself less for a greater purpose and a greater mission. And, you know, some of the lack of confidence was, you know, the fact that people do feel, some, you know, growing up uh, in my family, I, I felt loved. But just what was going on in society, there's always this question of, you know, can we, you know, why are we, you know, not as good as someone else? I think that was what was going on in my head. And I had to overcome that by, you know, again, listening to my parents because they would always encourage me. Um, but then I would always say, well, that's what the parents are supposed to do. They're going to say that. <laughs> uh, but that was kind of one of the things I think that, you know, the, where that crisis of confidence came from. And then it was overcome by, putting myself in positions where I could experience those little successes. And, um, and I, I think as, as you know, 
uh, data going through the academies, they give you multiple opportunities <laughs> to challenge you. To, opportunities, to, opportunities to fail. <laughs> and opportunities to exceed. You know, you can do all those types of things that, uh, and then when you do those, it's like, well, wow, I can do this. Exactly. And, uh, I, I, I think that's what, you know, kind of how you build it. Like you said, purpose, you know, there's a purpose. Okay, I'm going to do this obstacle course here, the requirements. I need to do this in order to be able to do that. I have to do this number of push-ups. I have to do this number of sit-ups. So there are goals that are out there that tell you what the definition of success is for that, you know, particular, you know, event or, or thing. And then that gives you purpose and a, and a way forward to see how you can meet, meet success in those areas. Yeah, I have a quote that you uh, have out there. It says, if you have any issues of confidence, start with discipline. It is like working on push-ups. The only way you can learn how to do them is to do them. You start small, set goals, and when you achieve them, then you set your next goal. Success breeds success, which is just uh, what you just said. I mean, beautiful. And it's within us to do daily. I, I tell you, Dana, you know, I, I read a book just recently, and it's been out for a while. There was, a, and folks may have heard about it. It's called uh, The Most Beautiful Thing by R. Shea Cooper. And it's uh, that documentary was, was actually out, um, and it was about the first all black rowing team um, and this was years ago so it's not current but the the story is awesome uh in a in an inner city chicago high school and mm -hmm. one of the things that you know that he mentioned and, and just the insight of these young men um living in an area that there should be absolutely no hope at all and uh and they were afraid of, for, they didn't know how to swim a lot of them were afraid of the water and, he, and someone said you know sometimes you just have to do things afraid Sometimes, you know, if you're afraid, you just have to do it while afraid. Don't wait to overcome your fear. Just do it afraid. And, um, and that's kind of one of the things, like you mentioned, you just got to do it. That's wonderful. So you uh, introduced us to a little bit of your family and being uh, one of 12, your parents adopted 12. And obviously, they know something about teamwork and <laughs> having you all work uh, together. You obviously learned some things uh, through that experience in addition to building your confidence, your humility. Tell us about how you uh, observed or learned teamwork from uh, witnessing uh, your parents. Well, it's, it's one of those, like, like you said, it's, uh, you know, in an environment like that, when you have 12 kids, and my parents were not people of means, uh, and they, they received no types, I mean, they're, they're from the Depression era, um, I told you my dad went in, in the military, so they knew how to live with less and they knew how to pull themselves up and not rely on others. In fact, they were dogged like that. They were tough. They didn't want to take handouts from anyone. They were, that was kind of their, their thing. So they had to, you know, they taught us how to work together with what we had, be satisfied, um, you know, not to the point where you don't want to work for other things, but don't, you know, always look to see what everyone else has. Do the best you can with what you have and learn how to share. We definitely had to learn how to share, especially like the bathroom, right? Uh, <laughs> with, a, with a lot of kids. So you learn organization. You just learn how to share. You learn how to, you know, take your turns on do, doing things. You learn how to, sometimes you were, sometimes you were first, sometimes you were not. And, um, but for me, I was the youngest. So I was the favorite. So I got a lot of buys and a lot of stuff for that. I mean, it was just, it was ridiculous. My older brothers, they all know that. They said, you know, it's ridiculous. You know, you're the, you're the baby, so you're the favorite. And so, but, but that was one of the things that, you know, we learned is, um, you know, it's, it's teamwork, it's working together, um, doing the hard stuff, doing the tedious stuff and, and just getting it done and not complaining. I hear that and doing your part, whatever your part is. But I also hear gratitude, like not thinking about what you don't have, but thinking about what you do have and doing, you know, the best with that. It's, uh, it's remarkable. It's beautiful. Yeah. So um, let's transition a little bit to talking about leadership at some of the highest levels in both the medical profession as the 44th Surgeon General and the uh, Commanding General of the Army um, Medical Command, but also a senior officer within the military. Um, leading in medicine and leading in the military, I might uh, ask you what you learned uh, in those venues and um, how that's translated into how you, your style and thinking about uh, your leadership, your moral leadership. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's really a, um, I mean, to unpack that one, because there's a lot there in that question about, you know, leadership uh, as a position, as a military officer, how the two, um, how the two, uh, you know, complement each other or don't, um, in some instances, 
and, uh, and, and things I've learned. So as far as being a, a military uh, leader, so I, I, I tell my team, uh, there's a difference between being a, uh, a doctor in the army and an army doctor. And it sounds the same. It sounds very similar. People are like, okay, it's, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're doing your craft in the army. Yes, but it's different because at this point, you know, after, you know, serving for so long, um, you cannot peel the army off of the doctor or remove the doctor from the army because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an inculcated thing at this point for me. Um, so the things I've learned as a military leader, the, you know, the, starting at West Point, uh, are, a lot of it's translatable to what I did as a, a physician and what physicians do and medical personnel do all throughout the, the time. It just it looks a little bit different. So if, if you recall from the service academy days, you learn leadership from day one. You learn responsibility. Um, I remember as a plebe, which is you know freshman for those not familiar with the terminology, the uh, one of the one of the, the first times I, I got in trouble, quote unquote, is when the um, the the belts on my roommate's uh, dress uniform. So if you remember the cadets with the gray dress uniform and then there's white belts that cross in the back and then there's like a little ceremonial cartridge, you know, uh, box from like the, you know, back in the uh, Revolutionary War days is attached to it. And so her back belt was twisted um, that was going into the box. And so we go out to formation. And so my, um, the, one of the, the squad leaders said, hey, Grammar, that was my maiden name, you know, why is so-and-so's belt twisted? And I'm looking and I'm like, oh, yikes, you know, and okay. Um, I didn't say it, of course, you're, but I'm thinking, you know, what does that got to do with me? But it's because that's my roommate and you're responsible. And she couldn't see that it was twisted in the back, but I could. And that, it's my job to have made sure that she was squared away. Um, and that's, you know, part of leadership. It's serving too. You're, it's, you know, making sure your team is squared away. So those are the things I think that started at West Point that takes, that took me all the way through. You're responsible for the people you lead or, you know, I wasn't necessarily a leader then, but, but, you know, technically in the room, you know, you're leading your roommate to do something. And so it's, it's, a, it's a small thing. In medicine, we do that every day. You know, it's not like with your traditional leadership, you know, with your, you know, what you would think of as leading a, you know, line of, of troops, but you're doing the same thing, um, just in a different uh, in a different manner, and it takes skills to do that. Yeah, you because know, you can't just tell a person, okay, or well, you can, okay, I'm gonna write this prescription, take this medicine, stop smoking, see me in three months, have a nice day. What's gonna happen? They may not pick up the prescription, probably not gonna stop smoking because they don't feel that you really care. You're just right. moving them along so you can see the next patient, and so it's it it it's, it makes a difference on how you lead your patients, just as how you lead in the military. Let's transition a little bit to uh, difficult decisions you've had to make. And, uh, you know, the higher up you go and you've gotten pretty high in the echelon, uh, those decisions are really hard. And, and usually not everybody is going to be um, behind that decision. So I wonder if you might share an example of a very difficult decision that you had to make and how you went about communicating that to the echelons, uh, to everybody, um, so that they would stay on the course with you and, and, and be dedicated to that goal, that mission, that purpose. Yeah, and I'll, I'll use one um, that, that happened uh, just a couple of years ago um, was, and it's, and it's kind of a, you know, it's not my decision, but as a leader, it becomes your decision when you're told this is what's gonna happen. And that's uh, when we had to severely downgrade one of our facilities, uh, our hospitals, um, in a location where that was going to have an impact on a lot of people. And so there's, there, we've been going through this uh, military health system transition. So I was told as the Army, you know, you know commanding general of MedCom, really because in my MedCom hat, um, you know, to, to decrease the, you know, go from a, a hospital to a clinic and then um, decrease the population served. So less retirees and, and, and folks that weren't active duty in a, in a facility. And so I remember when that decision, you know, when I, you know, I guess I relay the decision, but again, like they say, when, you know, you have to make the decision as your, it's your own. And so I had to make the decision on how to implement it and how to, you know, um, make sure that it goes forward. And that was very difficult because there were civilians that would lose their jobs. So how do I handled it is one, um, you know, 
I, I had several town hall meetings where I went there in person and actually talked to the individuals on several occasions. So communicating is always going to be important. First, you know, acknowledging that, hey, I, I feel your pain. And, and it sounds, you know, superficial if you just say, I feel your pain. But if you really say it, if you try to learn about it, and I told them, hey, I understand what's going to happen. We're going to lose, you know, I'm making up a number now, 22 RNs, we're going to lose three of this, we're going to lose five of this. Some of our retirees are not going to be able to come to our facility. And you know, that is really um, a, you know, scary thing for them. So giving them as much information. And then, you know, um, and then doing what you can to mitigate, to say, hey, I'm going to try to help you get to where you need to go. So the military, we're going to take care of you, our civilians who can move. And the ones who refuse to move, it's just like, um, we're, you know, we'll support you in any way we can, but we, we can't, we're not going to keep it open. So we can't keep it open so you can keep doing your, your, your position. And so, and then realize that there's, you know, uh, people that are, that you're, you're not going to win over, but the, but the, but the empathy, understanding, acknowledging, communicating, and then taking what action you can to assist others. Communication seems so key. Uh, some of our listeners are, you know, having to do furloughs or layoffs and so many difficult decisions. And so um, how does crisis um, uh, change or impact uh, the need for communication or how you communicate? Uh, is there a difference? Yeah, I, I think there, there is a difference. And I think it's, it's um, the difference is, you know, the time, usually there's a compressed time in a crisis. There's some jolt of something that's happening that's going to require you to, you know, change how you do things or, you know, um, you, you know, so it's a, it's a, to me, it's a time compression of time to get things done, but the leadership skills, you know, if you've been doing on a daily basis, leading people in a way with dignity and respect that you trust them, that you care about them, um, then it's going to be a lot easier that you've been open and honest, that you've been inclusive in all of your teammates, you establish that, you know, rapport with them, but you show them that you value them as members of the team beforehand, when the, when the, the switch gets flipped and there's a crisis, then that you can slide into that a lot easier because they know, well, I know General West and I know that, you know, she wouldn't be doing this unless it was absolutely necessary um, because that's how she's been before. You have to communicate in ways that you, you never have before. And I don't just mean by the mechanism, like uh, virtual, but you have to reach out to people more. You can't be passive and wait for them to talk to you. You need to reach out to them. If it's pick up the phone, if it's send them a text. And you, you also have to make sure that you tailor it to the needs of the people that you're communicating with. When I was at Fort Eustis, there was another one. We were downgrading from a hospital to a clinic. And this was in like 2003. And that was one where um, I just said, hey, Every Thursday, every second Thursday, we would have a, a meeting or every, every other Thursday, so two, two Thursdays a month. And I would say, and if there was nothing new, I would just say, okay, there's nothing new to tell where we are in this process, but I just want to let you know um, that uh, there's nothing. So you wouldn't think that there was something and I wasn't telling you. And if you have any questions, you know, we can, we can use this time to have, answer questions. And people really appreciated that. That's great. Um, Otherwise, they fill in the blanks, right? With yeah, they fill it in with something else. The so. case. Well, one of the things that obviously as um, moral leaders, and I'd like to get your advice on how to do this as a moral leader, uh, is when you have um, divisive perspectives or people who are polarized in viewpoints or uh, in how they're responding, how do you bridge that um, in the gray zone? Um, some have used the term the messy middle or you know that, that, that tension of the both and space. Uh, what are some strategies or how uh, might you go about doing that um, as a leader, as a moral leader? The first thing is, again, dignity and respect. Never stray away from that because if people know that you're coming at them, or and when I say coming at them, not like, you know, in an aggressive way, but if you are interfacing with them from a, from a place of dignity and respect, that you value them as a person of worth, and not just some obstacle or, you know, some jerk or some whatever negative name you might be thinking about them in your head, but they're a person um, that has a, a whole history behind them. And so I know that sounds very high minded and all, but, you know, Pope John Paul II, you know, St. Pope John Paul II said it good, you know, every, every single human being is unique, precious, and unrepeatable. 
And it really, that when I first heard that, it really kind of startled me because there are times when I didn't think of a lot of everybody else. I just thought of them as an obstacle or just a, you know, a toxic person. But well, they maybe they're toxic for a reason. You don't condone behavior, but there may be something to that person that you don't know about. And so I think the first thing is approaching another person, no matter, you know, no matter who they are or what their opinion is as a person deserving of dignity and respect. And the other thing is, is enlist the help of others mm -hmm. as well. I mean, not to gang up on, but, you know, just if there's this, there, if there's this, you know, um, you know, clear difficulty in having a communication that's going to get anywhere, you know, make sure that there's enough other people around so they can, um, you know, maybe provide some insight uh, to either side of what's going on, or at least be a witness, you know, so you're not in the, you know, so I, I think that's the main thing, coming at them with that, with that, let them speak, you know, let them, let them say their piece, and really try to learn what they're saying, and not just waiting and letting them talk till they stop, you know, finish, and then you can say what you want to say, but really learn from them, ask questions, um, and then, you know, realize that sometimes you can agree to disagree, and say, hey, we don't agree, but that doesn't mean you're a, you know, you know, a nasty person because your your opinion is different than mine. And uh, but I think the dignity and respect piece, you know, that it's hard. It's really, really hard. Easy to say, hard to do. Um, and but that's what you need to do as a moral leader. You have to keep the high ground. And there are times when I didn't, and I, you know, and I regret it when I look back because uh, you can't let people bait you or goad you into sinking to their level. And sometimes, you know, you know, sometimes you just kind of like. Ah, you know? <laughs> But that's the, and that's the challenges of a moral leader. Are you willing to share one of the examples that uh, you're thinking about where, uh, because we all are human and we do have egos and sometimes we're not as empathetic as uh, we would like. And uh, you, you alluded to that a little bit. If you're, if you're open to sharing that, that might be helpful for our listeners. Ooh, let me see if I should share this one. Well, I'll, I'll give it in general terms. Um, no pun uh, intended. Ah, ha, ha, ha. yes, no, but as, you know, as a, an army medical professional, the um, Walter Reed incident has um, a particular, uh, it, it was a particular stain on army medicine. I mean, we are, you know, the secretary of the army was, was you know, relieved over that incident at Walter Reed. The, you know, surgeon general of the army was relieved you know, some of our beloved leaders, you know, uh, one that was later, you know, vindicated, you know, General Waitman was relieved. And, you know, and that was really a dark day for, or a dark time period for, for Army medicine. And, you know, it put a pall over everything everywhere. So even people that weren't in Walter Reed, there's, there's you know, this quality of care, you know, quality and all this. And so, um, so there was someone who, you know, and this is years later, so this happened a long time ago, but it's still fresh in the mind. And I remember, you know, we were talking about, you know, something I was, you know, trying to, and this was, and I was fairly senior as a fellow general officer who said, well, yeah, y'all had Walter Reed and um, that was it. <laughs> I was like, you know, what, you know, it just, it just really annoyed me. And I, so I kind of, so I kind of, um, you know, you know, neck vein, face red, and uh, and you know, not it was not a good look, and because I basically was like that was you know really a low blow, low blow because I was you know a colonel during the time had nothing to do with it. We've moved forward. Army medicine has proven, and military medicine had proven itself. Um, just look at the success rate on the battlefield. We ha we are a high quality system. Yes, that was a blemish. We learned from it. We put things in place, we got over it, and it's done. And um, and so so, so I, I shot back with something like, oh yeah, so tell me about the soldiers who do atrocities. Are you gonna, you know, slam the, you know, this particular unit, you know, this famed unit for the actions of that? No, of course not, you wouldn't do that, but you know, Army Medicine, you're gonna hold us, you know, you're gonna throw that Walter Reed thing out there, like a red bull <laughs> for me, cause I'm like defensive of my Army Medicine, right? And so that was not a, you know, I should not have allowed that um, to uh, rile me like it did, but you know, again, and I, and I tried to justify to myself, well, I just really care about Army Medicine, well, I do, 
but I'm not doing it any favors by being goaded into, you know, right. becoming quite scary. You know? It's the human part of that all of That can be scary. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, the, um, the comment you made earlier as we were conversing about, you know, trying not to take things personally is easy to say, but, but sometimes the things that trigger us, uh, this maybe is an example, is, is often tied to our purpose and yes. something we care so deeply about. You care so deeply about supporting uh, you know, people, and it, particularly as a medical professional and as a leader. And so, yeah, it kind of gets to that trigger of, uh, okay, I get that, <laughs> because yeah. it's interconnected. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, <laughs> sharing that. And I think yeah, so I got a nickname. I got the nickname Ninja from, <laughs> from that encounter. Ninja. So, so like we kinda, of course, things kind of calm down. Yeah. Naja, I love that. As we wrap up, I want to share a quote that you made about empathy, and, and it is so much empathy, humility, um, you know, communications, um, moral leadership, service, so much of uh, what we uh, uh, sense from you. Uh, this quote gets at it a little bit in terms of one characteristic that stands out in all leaders you've seen is empathy. You don't have to be like everyone else, uh, but you can try to connect with other people. Please, um, like if people can tell if you care about them or don't. Uh, you have to show the people who work for you that you may not know where they are from or their background, but you are responsible for them and you try to figure out the best way to connect with them. If you treat every human being with dignity and respect, you can't go wrong. So as we wrap up the uh, conversation, um, we're obviously in this virtual world of trying to empathize and understand each other and care for each other. Uh, and we're going to be in this likely for a while. And uh, of course, not everyone, there are first responders and there are people that are still dealing with uh, on the ground types of issues. But how do um, you advise us of how to um, best connect in this virtual environment and to express that empathy and treating people with dignity and respect uh, for our listeners? Yeah, and it's really hard, but it's just kind of like getting back to our basic humanity is just reaching out to people, asking them, how are you? And not letting them say, fine, and then move on. You know, like, okay, that's good, move on. No, really, how are you? How are things going? You know, how is your family? Do you have a family? Do you have, you know, what are, what are some of the issues going on? So learn about what their concerns are, um, you know, and you learn so much about people that, uh, and, and, and you, you get a better appreciation for the, the things that people do. And, and I, I remember as, as a real quick story, one person, I would see her in the morning because she would take the cart down the hall to the, uh, you know, the, to the Army Senior Leader um, conference room and they would have like a conference room and she was always, and they get there early in the morning and I, you know, they're always neatly dressed in their uniform. And so I, I just started talking to her and um, I learned, you know, she was a, uh, an E5, Sergeant E5, and learned a little bit about her, where she was from. She'd set up a scholarship program for her high school and would go back on leave and mentor some of the kids in high school. This is a young sergeant who, you know, um, you know compensated well, but setting up a scholarship fund, and it wasn't for a whole lot, but you know, you just learn about people when you, I never would have known that. You just see people passing you in the hall and you just think that's a, you know, person going to go take the water and coffee down to the conference room. And just the, the life and the background, the things that she was doing to help. And she didn't make it, she didn't advertise it. I had to, you know, pull it out of her when I was talking to her about stuff that she did. Yeah. And I think that's what it is when you say, how do you connect with people? You have to not, only, not force them into telling you, but make sure that they know that you really want to know. And if you really want to know, they'll share it with you. And then, then the question is, what do you do with that information? The best that you can, right? Sometimes you can't do anything. Sometimes you can say, hey, well, maybe I can connect you with so-and-so and they can do this. Or maybe you just have given them the opportunity to tell their story. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, like some of our old retirees when I was in the at, at Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center, I remember in the waiting room, you'd see a lot of these elderly gentlemen and women. And one, one little, little, and I'll say little old lady, I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner, but she would sit out there and I remember talking to her. She was, she was on the Battalion Death March, one of the nurses. 
and you wouldn't have you wouldn't have even thought it just sitting there just people passed you by thinking some little old lady just sitting there she was a war hero mm -hmm. and you wouldn't know that unless you stop and talk to her um, and so i think that's it just talk to people and you can you know connect with them in that way and and, and I, I know they would appreciate it well thank you so much for uh you know the reminder about how important it is for us to care and to listen and sometimes that's all right uh, and people do um kind of are willing to share their story, particularly as it influences others. And you have done that uh, with us, uh, with the Next Gen Fellows, uh, and also now on our How Conversation. And so, uh, Lieutenant General Najo Ninja West. <laughs> I should have told you that story. <laughs> I know, uh, that's the last time I'll say it, ma'am. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I like it. Thank you, Thank you so right. much for your, uh, your sharing your time and uh, so many great lessons with us today for moral leadership uh, to keep that wave going forward. Uh, we respect you and, uh, and thank you. Thank you.